House Speaker Paul Ryan, thanks for joining us on C-SPAN. Let's talk about the tax bill because members of your own party already are saying there need to be some fixes, some revisions to the bill in 2018. So what changes, if any, hey, need to happen? First of all, let me just say it's good to be back with you, Steve. It's been a little while. Uh, We're glad so, to come by any time. Yeah, right, thank you. Um, anytime you do massive legislation like this, this is the biggest rewrite of the tax code. Uh, I'd say in more than 31 years, but the last big rewrite was 86. This is even more comprehensive than that. So we knew all along when you have such a massive rewrite of tax laws, um, you're going to have some technical changes that are gonna, going to need to occur. For instance, we rewrote our entire international tax system on how we treat international um, um, economics and, and, and cash flows. So that we knew would, would need some revising. Um, so far, though, not a lot of, of really needs to be done other than what I would call small things. No Republican support for the Affordable Care Act, no Democratic support for this tax bill. Is that the new norm? I hope not. I hope that's not. I was actually a little surprised that not a single Democrat voted for this. Um, I think they're going to be regretful of that because of just, just in 20 days, you've seen 2 million um, families, 2 million workers getting raises and bonuses. You're seeing all these raises being announced. You're seeing you know, electricity companies announcing that they're lowering rates as a consequence of this. In, in Milwaukee alone, uh, we have a big insurance company called Assurant. Um, a couple of months ago, Assurant said because of tax laws, they were going to move to Bermuda, become a Bermuda company instead of American company. And it said now because of the tax law, they're staying in Milwaukee, they're staying in an American company. You're seeing stories like that. Businesses staying here, businesses expanding, businesses investing in capital, workers getting wage increases, workers getting bonuses, better benefits. 401ks, maternity leave, all of those kinds of things are now being announced, and it's just been 20 days. So I think the Democrats are going to regret not having supported this. I think it's going to do tremendous things for our economy. And unfortunately, um, we are in a very, very partisan climate, but that doesn't stop us from doing what we think is right to help people in this country and help this economy grow. But as you know, Leader Pelosi is calling all of this, quote, crumbs. Yeah, I'm, I'm sad and surprised she said that. Uh, to somebody working at Walmart at the starting wage who just went from $9 an hour to $11 an hour, I don't think that's crumbs. To a person, you know, working paycheck to paycheck, just got a $1,000 bonus, that's not crumbs. I mean, 200,000 workers at AT&T got a $1,000 bonus. Uh, Comcast, just one company, is investing $50 billion in America in jobs, in, in expanding uh, across the country. Uh, this isn't crumbs. The additional maternity leave at Walmart, the higher 401k plans. The, there's a business in Stevens Point, a small assisted living um, center in Stevens Point just announced bonuses to their employees. These aren't crumbs. You got to remember more than half of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And so when they get something like a thousand dollar bonus at Christmas time because of this tax law, it's hardly crumbs. I want to go back to November of 1998. You were just elected as a member of House uh, of the House in Wisconsin. Uh, you appeared on a C-SPAN call -in as a member elect. Here's what you said. I think the first principle of tax reform ought to be that those who are on the bottom rung of the economic ladder should be held harmless. Give them a chance to get up on, on their feet to a road of self-sufficiency before they get whacked with taxes. Now, what I think is important is take a look at our current tax system. We're working till May the 17th in Wisconsin just to pay our taxes to the government. Our tax system is punishing all those qualities that make America great. So we can have a better tax system. Your reaction? Uh, that's what they call my Gumby haircut that I had back in those days, and I still have that tie. <laughs> so I've been working on this for over 20 years. I've been working on this issue um, pretty much my adult life. I, th I think you just queued up uh, when I was a staff guy. Uh, I, Jack Kemp was my mentor, and, and I worked on this issue for Jack Kemp. I've worked on this 20 years in Congress. Um, my reaction is, it's what I tell my kids. It's what I tell school students when I talk about civics and I talk about democracy and the republic that we are. If you believe passionately in something that's going to make a big difference in people's lives, what's great about our system of government is you work and you work and you push and you convince. You run on an idea by running for office. And if you get elected, you go try and, and put that idea in place to make a difference in people's lives. That's what these jobs are about. That's what's exciting about what I do. And it takes time in a system like we have. It does take time. And so tax reform literally has been something I've been working on for over 20 years. Um, this country, we've been talking about it for about 30 years. And it just takes time to do these things, but it does work. And that's, to me, a vindication of the system of government we have, which is representative democracy, 
and the fact that if you believe in something, you just got to stick at it and you can eventually accomplish those goals. And so that's my big takeaway on this. And I, I, I can get into the economics of it and why I think this is a really good thing for America. But the real takeaway I have, just looking back at when I you know, was a young guy pushing this stuff, it takes time to do big things in this country. And this country is a story of big things getting done. A number of states, California, New York, looking at so-called workarounds to get beyond that $10,000 deduction. Will you or the Republicans do anything to stop that? Yeah, I don't think that will work anyway. I think, I think I've heard the best idea or the, the, the big idea they're talking about is, is let uh, millionaires and billionaires um, pay their taxes as donations that they can deduct. That's just not going to work. I can't imagine the Treasury and IRS would even let that happen. So it, it, it is beyond reason to think that tax regulations filling out this w would allow that to happen. So uh, I, I don't even think we would have to legislate to prevent those kinds of workarounds. You mentioned your first appearance was 1995 on a Saturday morning, July of 1995, and you were talking about the debt at the time, which was approaching $5 trillion. Let's watch. Quaint by, by today's standards, isn't it? Yeah. This budget debate, what is this about? It, this budget debate is evolving into a fundamental difference between the two parties. One, the Republicans, we say we have to balance the budget. We've got to pay down the debt. It's interesting to note that the Clinton administration's budget proposal for this year projects building more deficits uh, in excess of $200 billion as far as the eye can see, adding on top of the debt. We think we have to balance the budget as soon as possible. That was 1995. The debt is now $20 trillion, and the tax bill will add another trillion to the debt. Yeah. Uh, I think my haircut was better in 1995 than it was in 1998. It's <laughs> taking a look at that. Uh, if you take a look at all of our full-scale efforts, uh, like our budget that we passed this, this past year, the Diane Black budget, uh, that had a lot of reforms in it, and that is a balanced budget. So uh, I wrote eight of our budgets that we passed since, um, since I've been in Congress, uh, which are all balanced budget plans. The problem is you've got to get these bills to the House, to the Senate, and the President to sign them into law. Um, we think there's two things you basically have to do <coughs> excuse me, to get the debt under control. You have to reform our entitlement programs. You have to make them work better. You have to make those dollars stretch farther. And you have to prepare for the retirement of the baby boomers, which we're really not prepared for. And you have to grow the economy. This is the, one of the most important things we could have ever done to grow the economy. So this is a piece of our fiscal agenda, which is economic growth through tax reform or regula regulatory reform. I do not believe that this is going to add a trillion plus uh, dollars to the debt. I think the economic growth, I don't know what the number is going to be, but I think the economic growth is going to help be tremendously helpful for us. And it's going to, what it's going to do, it's going to help people earn more wages, pay more taxes. More companies will come back into the country. They'll bring their dollars overseas back into America. That's going to help with growth. But that doesn't mean to say we should not be focused on spending. We should also focus on the spending side of the ledger. So on entitlement <clears throat> reform, Leader McConnell said that that's a non-starter. Yeah, I mean, we, we, have, um, we have a challenge in that they have a razor-thin majority over in the Senate, and it's extremely hard to pass um, big things like this. What... I regret the most is the fact that we have yet to reach bipartisan consensus on comprehensive entitlement reform when all of us know that this is necessary to get our debt and deficit under control. You literally cannot tax your way out of the entitlement problems that we have with the oncoming baby boomers. So we need to grow the economy faster. This helps us do that. And I'm, I'm glad we did it. I'm very excited that we've done this. But at the end of the day, we're going to have to get bipartisan support to, to fix our entitlement programs. If we do nothing, sink, for instance, Social Security, it goes broke and people get their benefits cut. We don't want to see that happen. Bottom Medicare line. is already on borrowed money, more than 50%. We don't want that to happen either. So we've got to, these are important programs that we have to preserve and, and save for not just this generation, future generations. And that's going to take bipartisanship. Will it happen this year? Not on the ones I just mentioned. I just don't think that's in the cards. But I think there are other things we could probably do to help get people from welfare into work. So that, they're, so that they're getting a better job, a better life, and paying taxes. And what about the, the plan by the White House to make sure if you're on Medicaid, some applicants would have to work? Well, we've long supported that. That was part of our, our plan uh, in the House passed bill. So that's something we passed back in May in the House. So that's something we're obviously in favor of. The president is also suggesting that uh, earmarks should come back on Capitol <laughs> Hill as a way to try to grease the skids. Yeah, you know, I was one of the guys who authored the ban on earmarks. Uh, there is a frustration among many of our members that the constitutional responsibility of the purse, Article I constitutional powers, um, has been ceded to the executive branch too much. 
there is a legitimate argument and point to be made there, but I do have concerns about uh, the old log rolling pork barrel earmark process that we had, which I helped stop. Um, but I do believe that there's, there's, there's a concern about having more legislative branch oversight on how the executive branch spends money. But we've got to make sure that this doesn't become, that, that we don't go back to pork barrel spending. Do you worry that if earmarks came back that it could hurt the, the numbers in the House? No, I just worry that it could lead to pork barrel spending. I, I could worry it will be lead to bad government. That's what I worry about. Steny Hoyer was on C-SPAN earlier today, and he said that uh, Republicans tell him the Democrats will take back the House next year. Oh, well, I can't speak to that. I, I, Republicans don't tell me that. L final question with regard to Chairman Ed Royce, who is stepping down. Uh, should, it, should you readdress the issue of uh, term limits Gosh, for chairmanship? No, no. I, I, I would never have become chairman of Budget Committee, let alone Ways and Means Committee, if it weren't for, for term limits. I'm a big fan of term limits. I think we should have term limits on Congress itself, uh, but, but given that that's a constitutional amendment, we've not been able to produce the votes for that, at least in our own control, we should control our, our uh, term limit for our chairmanships. Um, you're seeing chairmen retire now, and that's the, we're, we're having a number of them because we operate in the Republican House with uh, six-year terms, meaning two, three terms, six years total for a chairmanship. And they're all on a similar cycle. So we have a lot of chairmen who are coming at the end of their chairmanships in this year. And that's why people like Ed Royce are retiring. But what that does is that gives younger, newer members the ability to move up into the ranks and move up and take these chairmanships. And bring, it brings fresh blood, fresh turnover new ideas, fresh perspectives. I think that's a good thing for Congress. And finally, what's the biggest challenge for you in this job? <laughs> what's the biggest challenge? Getting things passed, uh, getting big things done. Uh, what, I, what I'm excited about, we ran on a very specific agenda in 2016, and we, we came around, uh, we all got consensus on what that agenda, we called it the better way. And now we're in the middle of executing it. I'm very excited that we passed more bills this past year uh, in this president's first year of office than Reagan, Bush, Bush, Clinton, Obama. Um, meaning we passed, we were very successful. We passed our bills. They haven't gone all the way through the Senate. We've got over 400 bills still stuck in the Senate that have not been moving through like the House has. So getting these bills, not just through the House, but into law is the biggest challenge, given the fact that they had the filibuster in the Senate, the narrow majority, and that we're, we're so partisan. I'm hoping that we can get some more bipartisanship this year and we can break those log jams, get some things through into law. But, but that's basically the hardest thing. Not just passing the House, but getting them into law, which is beyond the House's control. So that's why the tax reform achievement was so historic. And you intend to be Speaker in 2019? Uh, look, that's something that my wife and I discuss uh, in the election year in the spring. That's, uh, we had this customary uh, conversation <clears throat> before filing deadline in, in, in Wisconsin. Um, that's the kind of conversation we'll have then, but I, I have no plans on going anywhere right now. House Speaker Paul Ryan, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me back.